Hi, welcome to Wither the Luniversity episode three. I'm Adam Elwanger and my guest today is Professor Eric Smith, who is Associate Professor of Rhetoric and Composition at York College of Pennsylvania. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about him. He is co-founder of uh, a site called Free Black Thought, which we'll talk a little bit about today. Um, he is a critic of, of so-called anti-racist pedagogy um, and CRT, um, or critical race theory. He's also a member of Heterodox Academy. Um, if you're interested, you can follow him at Raytors of York. That's R-H-E-T-O-R-S underscore of underscore York on Twitter. Uh, Eric, thanks for, thanks for joining me today. Uh, thanks for having me. So one of the things I was interested in, in talking to you about is you and I are in the same field, which is mm -hmm. a fairly small field. Um, and I thought maybe you could tell us a little bit about your training in rhetoric and composition, what drew you to that and what your work, your academic research in that area has, has focused on to get us started here. Well, uh, first I'll say that, you know, I, I think the field of rhetoric uh, and composition is rather large if you think about all the adjunct faculty and the uh, contingent faculty and the graduate students teaching four or four course loads of comp. Uh, you know, they, they, when you add those guys in, it's huge. Uh, but the people actually, you know, doing the uh, majority of the publishing and things like that is relatively small. Unfortunately, the majority of the publishing and the niche uh, category of anti-racism is the kind of stuff I do not approve of. And uh, that is a major impetus for why I'm here today. Um, all that being said, could you repeat the question? <laughs> <laughs> Just what drew you to rhetoric and composition? I mean, what sparked your interest in it early on, and uh, that, uh, yeah. and what your research early on, before the sort of CRT took hold and things like that, was about? I went to graduate school to uh, get a master's degree in American literature, uh, focusing mostly on, um, you know, uh, creative nonfiction. You know, um, I'm doing more Emerson than Hawthorne, you know what I mean? Uh, more William James than uh, Henry James. Uh, but then I took a class on theories of the sublime, all right? So we're still not at rhetoric yet, but a door is being opened, right? Uh, we talk about, we, we, do, uh, we do Longinus in this class. And um, when I read Longinus, I was like, okay, so there's this, oh, wait, there's a rhetoric program? What am I doing here? <laughs> right. So I felt like I was spinning my wheels, you know, because I mean, no offense to English professors or things like that. But after a while, you're you're reading stories and talking about them. I, 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 I know that's a simplistic way of looking at it, but that's how I felt. I felt like I could do more important, uh, you know, uh, things with rhetoric. Uh, so that's where I went. So uh, I finished my master's degree, uh, applied for the Ph.D. program in language literacy and rhetoric. That was the official name of the. Uh, program and that's that you know so uh what what i saw in rhetoric was just a, an ability to analyze the world and our you know communicative dynamics the way people were trying to analyze chaucer and um i i, I thought it was better to do the real world situation i had a very similar uh experience getting sort of pulled into rhetoric from literature and it felt the same to me it felt like in, in literature, what we often did was read this text, and then we usually didn't talk about things like aesthetics or form or style. We usually just sort of use the story as a springboard for a social critique. Right. Um, and I sort of eventually was like, why don't we just cut out the middleman and go straight right. to the social critique? <laughs> um, right. And so eventually I made a similar choice to you. Um, you're, you, you mentioned uh, the work of adjuncts earlier, and we should probably get back to that at some point. Um, but I wonder, uh, you, you um, I think, loosely could be called anti-woke now. Um, and you talked to me once in a, in a private conversation online about sort of an origin story that you had at a particular conference. I think this was a major conference in our field. And I yes. wonder if you could recount that story for us. One thing that the guests on this program so far have shared is that they've had kind of this, I, I mean, for lack of a better uh, metaphor, an awakening to the problems in the university. Um, and I'd like to hear yours. 
an awakening, not an awakening. That's right. Yes, That's yes, right. we have to be explicit about that. And I also appreciate the fact that for the first time, I'm being interviewed by another scholar in rhetoric. <laughs> you know, that's that's the first time this happened. So so uh, this this will be interesting. And I'm happy for it. Um, three years ago at the arguably the flagship conference uh, in the field, uh, the conference on college composition and communication, I attended the keynote address uh, put on by a uh, scholar focusing in anti-racist pedagogy uh, named Sao Inoue. And the point of his presentation was you know, uh, white professors are inherently a problem. Um, you know, uh, teaching uh, standardized English or going about the uh, recognized habits of mind that are conducive to success, not just in college, but beyond. All those things were a form of white supremacy um, because you were projecting it onto students of color who don't feel that way. Um, so, I mean, this is a very erroneous statement. Right, and I'm, I'm to be fair, I'm paraphrasing, but that was basically it. All right, which um, is a and, common position in our field. Right, which is a common position in our field. So I went on the uh, primary listserv for the um, field, which is now defunct because of yours truly. <laughs> um, we'll we'll get into that uh, momentarily, and I and I said, uh, is this really the best way of going about doing this? You know, are, are we sure, is, is it, are we doing this because it's just really hard to teach writing and we need another angle? Uh, do we really think this is going to, you know, uh, affect things positively? And the response I got to uh, that inquiry changed me, right? Something snapped, you know, um, even, I mean, all these responses riddled with logical fallacies. <laughs> you know, are being applauded as the most brilliant thing ever. I'm like, really guys? Because that's wrong, that's wrong, that's factually incorrect, that's just nonsensical. And, um, and, and initially I wasn't, you know, that straightforward. I was trying to be civil. I didn't realize I wasn't talking to a, um, a group of academics. I was talking to a, a group of, uh, it was a degradation ceremony and not a conversation. I didn't realize that until it was, yes. I didn't realize that until it was too late. Um, so, I was taken aback by this. And then on Twitter, they're talking about me, right? And I didn't realize that until I was scrolling through Twitter as one does, you know, and, and I came across it and I said, oh, well, maybe I should try to set the record straight here, right? <laughs> that was turned into me stalking people, right? Um, so yeah, so all this stuff happened. And I realized, oh my God, this is way too far gone. I have to do something about this. I was writing a book at the time um, that had to do with, um, you know, um, uh, writing pedagogy uh, as it pertained to race and things like that. It had to do with that. But I revamped that book with like three months to go until the uh, deadline. I do not recommend that. Um, that's how adamant and, and passionate I was about this. That book turned into a critique of anti-racism and rhetoric and composition. Um, and, and in that, I, I, you know, talk about this incident, I talk about some of the scholarship and where it goes wrong, you know, where it goes right to an extent, but mostly uh, where it goes wrong and why. And I attribute it to disempowerment. That's being called empowerment, which um, led to my second book, not my second book overall, but the book after that, um, called The Lure of Disempowerment, Reclaiming Agency in the Age of CRT. Um, which elaborates on the second chapter of that book that elaborates on empowerment theory, which I see as a, a very nice um, replacement or alternative to the current anti-racism I'm seeing, not just in my field, but in academia and beyond. So, so that's uh, how I got here. It, it's, it's the cognitive dissonance that that, that thread caused me, kind of, yeah, it, it changed my trajectory of my my, um, my career, right? My focus, you know, I, I'm all about this now. You know, I was, I was going to, I had just gotten tenure. I was going to, um, you know, work on the confluence of Buddhist philosophy and rhetorical theory um, as it specifically pertains to a sect of Buddhism called Nichiren Buddhism, which is a, a Japanese uh, Mahayana Buddhist sect. Um, and, and I saw a lot of stuff there to do. I was excited to do it. And I was on my way, and then 
this happened. And so, I was like, I can't, I can't, I got to do this. When we first talked about this, I was under the impression that this happened in a, in an oral setting, like at the conference, this happened in a textual setting yes. online. Yes. Now, let me ask you, you have to indulge my curiosity, right? When, when you engage these people and sort of said, Hey, you know, like there, there's some problems with, with this idea of teaching and, and pedagogy, were they aware that you are in fact a black guy or, you know, yeah. they were, oh, yeah. they they were all aware. Okay. Yeah. That's because surprising I, to me. Because yeah, I like, said so, yeah, yeah. It seems like, you know, it, in that cult, right? It seems that your status as a black man would sort of elicit automatic deference to your position. Um, well, you would think so, but then you get white people calling you a white supremacist. <laughs> <laughs> and you realize that that's not entirely the case. There's there's a right way to be black. Yes. And I was doing it incorrectly. Yes. You know, yeah. and I had to be punished for that. Especially and, me, and right? Especially me because a, a black guy saying this that that has a level of ethos that is harder to uh, refute. So they 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 had to double down on me. Right? That's why the degradation uh that's why the um struggle session was so intense. So it um, there's, there's a lot of sort of black intellectuals who are very devoted to making sure that, um, black thought for lack of a better term stays on script. Um, right. and I wonder, I assume that this was a, a part of the impetus for you founding, uh, free black thought in part to kind of provide an alternative or at least to, to, um, maybe help people realize that there isn't this sort of uniform intellectual political consensus um, among sort of black Americans and uh, kind of to break up the hegemony of, of sort of the um, left black progressive standpoint. I mean, is, is that the idea? Could you talk to us a little about what you hope to achieve with the site and just tell us a little bit about the site in general? Uh, well, first, I want to say that I am a co-founder of um, Free Black Thought. There are several other people uh, involved. And um, I wasn't even there at the very beginning. I was there at the beginning, not the very beginning, when uh, this was conceptualized. Um, and, um, you know, uh, we came across each other. And I said, you know, we said, you know, kind of, uh, you know, collectively, you know, I, I need to be a part of this, right? But I've been dealing with this since I was a kid. You know, this this is a uh, new to a lot of people, but I, I I was dealing with this in middle school in the '80s. You know, I mean, it's, it's it's nothing new to me. This is by no means the first straw; it's the last. You know, which is why it made me totally change the direct the uh, trajectory of my career. Free Black Thought um, focuses on showcasing the viewpoint diversity within the Black community. Now, I don't even like saying Black community; that is essentializing in my mind. But I say it because that's the term that you know people are familiar with. And as a rhetorician, you have to consider your audience and take what you can get, right? There are only certain means of persuasion available to you, right? At particular times, uh, so you got to deal with that. So I do say black community uh, now and again. Um, but uh, that's what it's all about. We have a journal um, that also you know focuses on these things, but it also wants to. We want to make sure at the journal that we give voice to. Uh, you know, people who aren't represented in mainstream media, right? And like you said, there's a particular narrative, uh, there's a particular dramatist persona, right? And um, there are roles and, you know, you can only be cast in this role, right? You can only be cast in this role. That's that, that's the narrative, that's the script. Um, and a lot of black people are like, I don't like that script. You know, I wanna write a more inclusive script. You know, and um, I don't need every white guy to be the antagonist in this story, right? Um, so for people like that, you know, we have free black thought. Uh, the website, which has a compendium of uh, text, uh, you know, from fiction to photojournalism, um, uh, academic scholarship, obviously, uh, op-ed work, uh, that also drives home this uh, diversity of viewpoints within the black community. Right, so that's that's what we're trying to do there. And it's something that I'm passionate about because as I said earlier, this is something I've been doing for quite some time. This is something I've been dealing with really since my age was in the single digits. 
you know, um, but I, I started to realize it was a thing in middle school. And I remember telling myself, I can't wait until I grow up so I don't have to deal, deal with these idiots. <laughs> you know, when I grow up, everybody's going to have sense. Right. And, and I don't have to deal with this anymore. I'll just let my merits speak for themselves. Right. And here we are. And, and that's another thing that really, really shook me during that email threat. You know, I'm like, they, they, they would never leave me alone. <laughs> you know, they, from, from fourth grade till now, they've been chasing me and they're not going to stop. It's time for me to fight back. And that's what I'm doing. It's a very strange time, I think, especially for people sort of older than 40 years old. Um, I grew up in Rochester, New York, and um, I, I remember one day on the bus, there was a kid singing a song that used the N-word. I remember that I didn't know what that word meant, but I thought mm -hmm. the song sounded cool. Um, yeah. And I memorized it as they were learning it. And at home, I was singing it to myself. And my mother said, what'd you just say? And I said, so I don't, I don't know what I just said. I just said it. And, you know, she explained it to me and she said, you know, like you never say that word again. And I didn't. Um, and I was, I think like a lot of people, our age, your age, my age, people in that age range, she were brought up under this idea that doesn't matter. What matters is who a person, essentially the content of your character right. is it. And, it. and it now seems, especially in universities, right that that default assumption has, has been turned into exactly the wrong way to view difference. Um, uh -huh. And I think it's made it very hard to navigate these conversations, which is why I think in some ways, non-white intellectuals are going to have to lead the way because to critique it from any other ethos, right? A guy like me to say, look, this is dumb and it doesn't make sense is that automatically feeds the it adds fuel to the fire rather than than cooling it, I think. Um, and so I appreciate the work you're doing there. It links in with your involvement with Heterodox Academy. Um, and Heterodox Academy has their meeting coming up at, at which you'll speak. Um, by the time that viewers are watching this or listening to this, it'll probably be in the past. But um, I think you are, a, I know you're a member of Heterodox Academy. I don't know if you're in a leadership position or not now, um, but I am also a, a member of that group. Um, and their mission is, is to sort of spread the gospel of viewpoint diversity and to describe the, um, the value and importance of diverse viewpoints in an intellectual setting because that kind of is the the engine of new ideas and um, yeah. these things so i wonder could you tell us a little bit about your involvement with heterodox well after the uh infamous email thread i just spoke of uh i and uh another person decided well we need a space where we can say things and think critically without being attacked we need a space where we can actually be academics right, and not parishioners in some weird cult. Um, so heterodox ret comp uh, was created. Um, I wasn't the initial moderator, but I am now. Okay. So I guess I do have a leadership position in, in heterodox, but that's, that's where that came from. That's where heterodox ret comp came from, that email thread in the fallout. So, so we're there and, uh, you know, everybody in, you know, um, that email thread and most people in the field think that heterodox is some right wing organization. And uh, we all have, you know, swastika tattoos and we're out to get you and, and stuff like that, which is uh, couldn't be farther from the truth. Uh, the the demographics uh, lean left. Right. I mean, we have people from uh, all over the spectrum, but it leans left. Um, but, you know, of course, that's not part of the social reality they're dealing with. So. I'm Hitler. That's basically uh, how how this pans out. But yes, um, I'm a I'm a part of a uh, heterodox academy, moderator of heterodox uh, red comp, and I'll be um, speaking next week at at, at this point, uh, June fourteenth in Denver, Colorado, with Glenn Lowry and John McWhorter. Exciting. And yeah, to drive uh, home the um, you know the political spectrum. You know, Glenn's a, you know, a conservative. Uh, John and I identify as liberals. So, I mean, that's all over the place. And we're all Black. So, you know, the whole point, I mean, by our mere existence on a stage together, we're making the point. Um, but we're also going to talk. 
So I should be clear, um, because I told you that I wanted to talk a little bit about Heterodox Academy. And I want to be clear that you are not speaking on behalf of Heterodox Academy. These are your ideas about the organization, right? Yeah. 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 Okay. So this has been, I started out when I became a member of Heterodox Academy, I was very optimistic about the organization. And I went to uh, their meeting in New York City a few years back. And the feeling I came away from, from is that the people who were there really didn't grasp the severity of the problem. Um, and, and let me spell out like, like in what way. Um, okay. I think that Heterodox's main mission is to kind of spread the gospel, like I said, of viewpoint diversity um, yeah. and its importance in academic or intellectual inquiry. I think that this presumes one, that people in the university are unaware of the importance of viewpoint diversity. Um, And I don't think that that's true, right? I think that Mm -hmm. they know that that's important to intellectual inquiry, but I become convinced and I speak as a man of the right, um, you know, I become convinced that they, the, the people who are prosecuting wokeness in academia are not interested in academic inquiry. What they are interested in is ideological indoctrination. Right. And since that is their interest, right, it it doesn't make sense to create a space that's hospitable to intellectual inquiry and viewpoint diversity, right? If what you want is to produce ideological zealots, then you're going to consciously create a space where there is a lack of viewpoint diversity. Sometimes I feel like Heterodox Academy assumes that if people would just realize how valuable that is, well, then they'd be more inclusive in these ways. My point is they know exactly how valuable Mm -hmm. it is, but they're not interested in uh, open intellectual inquiry, right? They're aware Mm -hmm. of what that is. They know they'd rather, you know, pursue their utopian vision of of social justice and sort of create culture warriors. And if that's what you're going to do, viewpoint diversity is just a needless hindrance um yes so i wonder how you'd respond to to that critique um in several ways uh the the first way is to say that i look at heterodox as a refuge you know that's that's what it is i'm not when i think of heterodox i don't think well if we with if people would listen to this organization everything would be okay That, that doesn't i i gave up on talking to the quote unquote woke a long time ago Right. And when I do talk to them, I'm really doing it for the people listening. Right. The people on the fence who don't really know, you know, what's going on yet, uh, you know, to warn people before they fall into the trap that so many have already fallen into. Um, that's when that's why I uh, I try to engage. But I, I'm done trying to convince them because, you know, their primary tactic is to not listen. You know, it's, it's not like they have the inability to not listen. They're making a concerted effort to not listen. That's part of what this is. And that goes way back to, um, and I, 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 I feel less and less like a conspiracy theorist when I say this, which I, I guess is uh, okay. Uh, but that, that speaks to the, you know, communist tactics uh, that um, this derives from, you know, the Frankfurt School and the critical theory which spread out into legal studies and critical race theory and things like that. These are, these are explicit tactics Right, you know um, that Lenin, Trotsky, all these guys talked about. You know, Marcuse, they 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 all don't listen to them, wow. right? You know, and, and, and there's no way a hegemonic force is not trying to trick you. You know, the, 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 there's no such thing as a good faith conversation with them. They're 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 bad. I'm reminded of Wayne Booth's listening rhetoric, and um, he had various degrees of listening rhetoric. Listening rhetoric is supposed to be just I'm going to give you the benefit of the doubt, listen to you and sincerely try to understand what you're saying. And ideally you would do the same for me. Um, there are degradations of listening rhetoric and listening rhetoric C is, I'm only listening to, listening to you to find a way to trick you, right? I'm gonna find the weakness and, and trick you, right? I'm not here to work with you or understand you. I'm, I'm here to get over on you, right? Um, they think everything's that. Yes. Everything's listening rhetoric C or at least they're pretending to think that. Right, because they need to. They need to demonize us to the best of our their ability so that they can win. Um, so I'm I'm done with them. Um, I think uh, heterodox can't do. I, I agree with you. Heterodox can't do anything with people like that. But what they can do is give people like us a place to actually practice 
uh, you know, inquiry with things. Now, uh, we, we probably agree on the fact that viewpoint diversity is a good thing. So there's, that's not viewpoint diversity, ironically, <laughs> right? Um, but it's still a space where I can actually feel like an academic mm -hmm. and, and not a heretic. Yes. I've kind of embraced the ethos of the heretic. Um, you know, like, uh, I think uh, um, they're needed. And, and, and once you embrace it, I feel like you can speak some truths that otherwise can't be spoken. Um, yeah, yeah. So how did it get here? This is, um, the, I, I ask the same questions since, to some extent of everybody that I talk to. And this is one thing I find myself thinking about a lot. I mean, you, you touched on the Frankfurt School, you touched on um, sort of uh, communist methods of imposing hegemony and, and things like this. And all that's true, but, but the takeover has been so complete in, in my view and happened so quickly. I was an undergraduate, uh, I was a freshman in 1996. And I guess there were the, it was clear that the seeds of this had, were there, but it was so far off of, of what it is now. And I wonder when you think about how did this happen? Like, what what makes sense to you? How do you understand that? Um, how did it happen? Well, I, I think a lot of this has to do with uh, the 60s counterculture movement and how, you know, a critical theory derived from Marxist thought was a foundation of that for a while, right? And it did leak into uh, Black nationalism uh, to a large degree, which is uh, famously Angela Davis was a student of uh, Herbert Marcuse, who was a primary uh, figure in critical theory and this, you know, this Marxist uh, thought in Bronx, the 60s. Yeah, there's that, right? I mean, there are a lot of different people. Um, and, and, okay, so let's stick with the critical theory thing. Um, let's stick with uh, Marxism. Uh, using black people, you know, for their uh, for their political purposes goes back a hundred years. At least. Right? Trotsky, Trotsky talked about it. There's a book about Trotsky talking about it, and it's not about Trotsky. It's his writing, right, <laughs> or, or, or his speaking. Um, I told you about the uh, Frankfurt School and, and Marcuse uh, and, and things like that. Uh, Lenin talking about what education should look like and how, you know, communism is the alpha and the omega and however you can do that, do that. Everything's about that. So you're not teaching math, you're teaching math insofar as it can help you maintain communism. You know, you're teaching history insofar as it can make help you maintain communism. Nothing so, outside the party. Nothing outside the party. So you add nothing outside the party to, wow, Black people make a great proletariat. Right. I mean, we don't have to convince them that things are bad. They, they, you know, they hate hegemony too. Let's let's ride that wave, right? And you 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 put those things together, and um, you know, you plant that seed, and now it's a sequoia called critical race theory and anti-racism. So I, I think that has a lot to do with it. Um, obviously, there's you know you know run-of-the-mill racism in society and uh, people starting this movement in the 70s uh, who think that enough wasn't done in the civil rights movement and that um, things were taking a little too long, right? And these people didn't necessarily read Marx, right? Or any uh, Marxist theorist, but they were on that wave. So there was a psychite going on there too. It's a very dynamic origin story uh, uh, as, as you can discern uh, from what I'm talking about. But all these things come into play and they're all relevant. To the point, and I, I've been saying this a lot lately too, because it's true, um, Lenin made a speech to the um, Youth League, you know, the, the Russian Youth League about education, what education should be like. And if you replace the word communism with anti-racism, it's Ibram X Kendi. It's, it's, it's Kendi, you know, <laughs> it's, it's like he played Mad Lib with this uh, speech from Lenin in 1922, right? And, and, and here we are. So, I mean, it's, it's not an exaggeration. It's by no means a stretch to uh, connect, you know, contemporary anti-racism to uh, Marxist thought. It's all there. You got to follow the, not the money, you got to follow the paper trail. 
So at this point, it's almost like the, these trends are self-sustaining in the sense that it's reached a critical mass that this sort of, like you said, you don't even need to read Marx. You don't need to read at all, really, because right. it's in the water now. It's, right. it's sort of just in the structure of the institution itself. So it seems normal. It seems like just the way things are. And this is one of the things that I think make it really in, intractable is, is um, it, it's taken on a status of, of the norm. Um, and so younger students, um, younger students who might one day enter sort of the university world as a profession uh, have, have sort of suckled at the teat of wokeness since they were, I mean, before they came to college um and they didn't even know it uh right. and so i guess this leads me to my next question you you sort of acknowledged that there's there's very little that heterodox can do to sort of convert um or deprogram these people um and yet they are the people who hold power in american higher education today um both in in the administration at the staff level at the faculty level and the student level so given these facts, can the university in America be redeemed? Is there a way to do it? Um, well, the way to do it is, well, first and foremost, to speak up. A lot of this has to do with the fact that people are too afraid to push back. If there is a pushback, at least that tension would change things. Would it be back to normal? No, but at least it wouldn't be this. <laughs> and people would see for themselves you know, that not everybody is on board with this, including black people, right? Including people of color, right? And including, uh, you know, uh, gay and lesbian people who don't, you know, fall into the gender ideology that's being pushed right now. You know, they'd see that. We need to model pushback. That's what we need to do. People need to see, oh, wait a minute. I'm not crazy. They are being idiots, you know, and this guy's pointing it out and, oh, okay, so I, I'm, it's, it's, it's possible to not agree with them. Good. This is fantastic. The problem is not enough people are speaking out. Um, I'm speaking out. Um, I, I'm, I'm one of the few people, I, I think, as far as I know, I'm the, you know, most uh, consistent, uh, you know, uh, uh, hater of anti-racist uh, pedagogy. Um, right now, some people, you know, say things here and there, but then they uh, back away for understandable reasons, but at least they're saying something. Most people are not. And, um, you know, I mean, if you're, if you're a tenured faculty member five years from retirement, and you don't like this stuff, and you're not saying anything, dude, I mean, I, I, I've been quoting Dante or something attributed to Dante anyway, it's probably apocryphal, but, you know, it's, it's the point that counts. Uh, and it, it goes something, no, it goes like uh, the hottest places in hell are reserved for people who, in the midst of a moral crisis, maintain the neutrality. There's a place in hell for tenured professors who don't say anything. Agreed. Right? And, and I, and I, and I want to say that to them, right? Uh, which makes me, I'll say this, this is slightly off topic, but not really. I'm less of a rhetorician now and uh I, i'm more into uh i guess what some people would call parisia right truth telling and, yeah well, well here's the thing you could truth tell with rhetoric but but the the thing is people know who and what i am you know that listening rhetoric c comes in oh he's a rhetorician of course he's saying this that and the other thing so my ethos as a rhetorician could be a um liability in some sense you know, I've been accused of uh, rhetorical gymnastics from other rhetoricians, and all I was doing was speaking syllogistically, you know, um, you know, as straightforwardly logical as possible, right? So, I mean, if that's happening, I got to be the guy who just says stuff, right? And, and I, I, I got to purposefully be that guy. So, I mean, I'll be the asshole, right? You guys, like, maintain civility, speak up against this, but you can maintain your civility. I'll be the asshole, you know, who says what he needs to say. I'll take that on. Right. So, uh, yeah. I'm glad you brought up Parisia because Parisia is, is a form of, of truth telling that we talk mm -hmm. about in rhetoric, but most of the time it's theorized as 
truth telling that exposes oneself to risk yeah critical truth telling um i think our woke enemies in the university see themselves as truth tellers but what they miss is that there is absolutely no risk in involved in shouting the the white dude you know on campus down as a white supremacist right yes all that does is score you sort of virtue points in in the campus hierarchy and i think that um i i think you and i have all you've already said you're tenured i'm tenured too and so it, there's less risk involved for me to say this, but I wonder like, okay, so a 65 year old dude is going to retire in five years. Like he should speak, but he's really got no skin in the game because he's like, Oh, these people are crazy. I'm out in five years, whatever. Right. Undergrads don't dare speak out against this stuff because they know that their teachers are more rhetorically sophisticated and can shut mm -hmm. them down. Right. And also can impact them grade wise graduate students to some extent are even less willing to take the risks inherent in in speaking out because the, they have so much on the line in terms of their career prospects their their um, supervisors in terms of their dissertation things like this uh, you know a tenure track faculty uh, have very um, high risk in speaking out. Um, and like you, we didn't even talk about the adjunct thing, but we should, right? Adjunct work, um, those people are in such a precarious position financially, really holding on to academia right. by their fingernails that they'd be crazy to say anything, which basically leaves guys like me and you, people who are under 60, tenured, and a little crazy right like willing to lose friends over and and sort of lose esteem from colleagues uh for uh speaking what what needs to be said and so i guess i'd say like if the solution is speak up well it seems that i've said look there's like eight layers of the university that won't or can't do that and expose themselves to the risk and then there's a layer of people like you and me so talk a little bit to that um, well, like I said uh, before, I have to, this is 24 seven for me, you know, and, and it has to be because not enough people, you know, I'm, I'm one voice. So I have to speak up often enough to seem like 20. Right. Um, and, and, and that's the way it, it has to be right now. Uh, yes, there are people who for very good reasons aren't speaking up, but there are people who for very bad reasons aren't speaking up. They're not speaking up because they don't want you know, the, 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 the faculty cocktail party to be uncomfortable. You know, you know, they're letting all this happen. They're letting black people, black students and faculty be infantilized and disempowered because they want to have fun at a party because they don't want to deal with any kind of drama from their uh, colleagues, you know? Uh, so I mean, when you put it that way, and I plan on putting it that way a lot, you know, you really call them out for the, uh, Again, I'm going to be the asshole, the cowards they are. Now, during that infamous email thread I told you about at the beginning of our conversation, a common refrain for people who were, you know, basically insulting me, not very much, you know, uh, in argument, but a lot in ad hominem and straw man, I'll tell you that. They, they, were, they were commended for their bravery. They were commended for their, oh, you're so brave to do that. Can Zero we, can risk. We, can we, can we acknowledge the brave? Zero risk. There isn't a safer place on the planet for them to say what they said. You know, me on the other hand, you know, uh, I'm a pariah now for what I said. If anybody was being brave, it was me, but that's not part of the narrative. The narrative is that the downtrodden person of color needs to be the hero and they're brave because they're speaking truth to power when that wasn't actually happening. The make-believe going on here, right? <laughs> I mean, well, it's, it's, it's a tactic. They know, and this is what a lot of people don't realize. They know damn well they're, being, they're wrong. They know damn well what they're saying makes no sense whatsoever. That's not the point. The point is power. The point is, uh, or, or for many of them, acquiring dignity because they don't feel like they have any, right? That's the point. And, they, and if they have to lie, cheat, and steal to do it, so be it, by any means necessary. Lenin is alive and well and in the hearts and minds of contemporary anti-racist pedagogues. Well, this is what's going on, I think, with a lot of how quickly white people have bought into their own demonization, 
right? Yeah. Is yeah. that there's this sort of understanding that, well, you know, I mean, I have this culpability, this kind of blood guilt, um, and I can't get rid of that. But what I can do is be an ally, right? Mm-hmm. And and what that amounts to is sort of um, uh, signing on to this sort of agenda of, of false empowerment um, so that you get your pass, so that you get your indulgence and you get to be one of the good guys again. Um, and that's that's sad. Uh, and I think you, you said something interesting. It, it's just this contradictory world of, of academia. I, I went to no, nothing fewer than four required faculty meetings for um, inclusion and uh, diversity training. Um, I work at a school that is about uh, 40% Hispanic, 20% Black, maybe uh, 15% white, a, a large chunk uh, his, uh, Asian. We hold those meetings in the most inclusive, diverse place and safe space in America. And Mm -hmm. this is a fixation. Uh, It's it's almost pathological. Um, And and uh, you you sort of speak to that is is that there's sort of just this refusal to to look at the reality of of the situation. Um, but I think maybe that's feigned sometimes. I think, yes. do you think that they know that or do you yes. think that they can't see it? Um, well, many know it, many can't see it, you know, and it depends on uh, where you're coming from here. I remember Kenneth Burke's distinction between the comic frame and the tragic frame. I'm reminded of that here, you know, um, <laughs> other people will call it, you know, cynics and fools. You know, um, there are cynics out there. They know darn well what they're doing. I have a, I, all you have to do is read one page of a Sal Nui's work. You know, okay, cynic. You know, this guy knows exactly what he's doing. You know, he, he's a car carrying Marxist and he's proud to say it. You know, I mean, I, and, and there are other people like that too. And then there are people who just bought into the ideology and, you know, uh, you know, want to feel more secure than they do. Um, the, the feeling of security is a foreign concept or a foreign feeling for them. And they see this as an opportunity to acquire some security. So they're, they're all in, right? So you have them as well. Um, although this is also probably apocryphal. Uh, it's attributed to Lenin a lot, but youthful idiots, you know? Uh, we have people like Asao Inoue, and then we have the youthful idiots following him. And then you have me laughing at both of them. Yep. Wow. Well, I appreciate the work you're doing enormously. I wish that I could be in Denver to hear you talk and to hear uh, McWhorter and Lowry. Um, and uh, I hope that I get to see you face to face at some point in the future if you dare set foot on on a uh, re- the floor of a rhetoric or composition conference. It would be fun to see the reactions to them of you and I together at one. It sure would. <laughs> it sure. I, I just, I, RSA was an hour away and I didn't go. I was just too busy. I was doing podcasts and, and, and things like this. And, you know, but you didn't uh, miss much. You, you know what you missed. You know what I, you missed. I, I know. I know what I missed. I know. Um, all right. Well, Eric Smith of York College of Pennsylvania, um, thank you so much for talking to us.